excite everybody about the um, the Eco Museum and the Heritage Database that we've got um, now for Tweedsphere, um, and to give people a little bit of an insight as to what you know how valuable a resource that is going to be for us, and how how um, how we can utilise that to make the most of um, the heritage of Tweedsmuir. Um, I think something that I've become really aware of since I started the job as a development officer and the heritage officer is that it's so much, so many fantastic stories in Tweedsmuir um, covering all aspects of history from, from centuries ago right up into the current day and it's all fantastic I mean I've been so excited about some of the stories that have sort of turned up that I didn't appreciate um, about Tweedsmere so tonight my my aim is just to sort of I'm sure lots of you already know these stories is but just to sort of highlight some of the stories that I think are really exciting about Tweedsmere this is only a tiny fraction of what is a, um, you know is going to be in the database and it's just to give people I don't know, just to excite you a little bit about what we could find out about Tweedsmuir and, and the other stories that um, are coming forward. So could you please make that share? I'm going to do it. It's a little PowerPoint and I'm just going to chat through um, a few stories that I think are really exciting. So does, has that worked? I can have a thumbs up maybe from somebody yet. So um, tweets your stories and I think where this starts for me is that the Crook Inn has been such an important part of Tweedsmere for such a long time and we would have told stories we'd have sat around sat in the bar and we'd have told each other stories and so many of the stories and, and myths and legends of Tweedsmere only exist because we've talked about them for centuries um, and I, and I think it's really clear now that, that we're losing them. Um, no longer do we sit around um, and chat about these things or sing round, round the crook. Um, we, well, we can't, we can't sit and sing in the crook. So I think one of the reasons for, for setting up this heritage database is to save all this stuff. Um, it's such an important part of our community and it has been such an important part of many communities, but um, with a sort of modern speed of life and, and the fact that we no longer just all sit down together as a community and chat and share stories and sing songs, there's a real risk that we lose some of these fantastic parts of our heritage. Could I move on? Space. No, it doesn't work very well. Gone. Stop sharing it. Oh, my technical expert has has failed and shown me how to make it work. Let's share it here. Just click on through the slides then. There we go. Um, so here's just a list. Um, of, I mean, I've just randomly picked stories that I thought were really interesting. There's no particular reason as to why I've picked these stories other than I just think they, they just, it's just amazing that these sort of stories exist in Tweedsmuir. I've got to say, there are some facts. So there are some facts that I've managed to pull together about some of these stories. A lot of these stories um, are just, um, word of mouth or they've been passed on so there's lots um, in each of the stories that varies but I think we can be clear that for everything that I've picked tonight there's definitely some element of truth in it and um, there's obviously a bit of poetic license in a lot of these stories and I, I just think that's great I don't I don't mind at all that that that, that um you know we're, we're, we're looking at some of these stories and making them just fantastic tales. So I'm going to look a little bit about the supernatural in Tweedsmuir just because I find that really interesting and I think it's just everywhere. And um, when you start looking at some of the the, the stories that I'm, I'm finding online and stuff, the supernatural Tweedsmuir is everywhere. Um, witch trials, I just wanted to mention that because I, I again that's something that just really interests me and I just, it, it sort of, it, um, I suppose it, it, it came back to me when it was something specific to Tweedsmuir. I didn't really appreciate that the Twitch, witch trials would be would have a direct link to an event in Tweedsmuir. Um, now the hill names are fascinating as are the farm names and everything and I've done quite a lot of looking into where these have all come from so I've just picked a few hill names that I think are particularly interesting. Bonnie Bertha is of course this, the 
fantastic story um, in Tweesby. I'm sure lots of you already know. I just think that's great. And I, I think that's something that we should make sure we share um, through our website going forward. Um, Jack the Giant Killer. I mean, this is this is great for me because the grave is in my field and it's been a long time um, that we have had no idea why we had a giant's grave in our field. So, um, so sort of in the last year or so, there's been some indication as to who that giant might be. Um, the plague and how that affected Tweedsmuir. Um, just a quick update on Genie of the Crook, particularly because that's something I've been working on recently. Um, the praying clash and broad law, just to show that we're still getting stories, you know, much more current. A lot of these things are, are historic stories, but the plane crash on broad, broad law is a much more current story. And again, really interesting. Um, and then Andrew's going to just give a quick update as to how all of this stuff and more can be can be saved and shared on our database. So do I just move on? Yeah. OK, so Supernatural Tweedsmuir. Just check, you're all seeing the big picture here, not the one with all the, yeah. the so, pictures. So you can see my wee map. Um, so up here, I think you can see my mouse if I move it. Up here is Weird Law. So Weird Law is, is the hill that's di directly opposite my field. So it's just, just down a bit from my house um, on the same side of the road. And Weird Law, um, to be fair, until about a year or so ago, I didn't even know or hadn't even investigated what the hill name was. So Weird Law, it sounds a bit interesting. It's not a very big hill. However, weird um, in Old Scots means destiny, fortune, or wizard. So, you know, sort of straight away, that's that's sort of beginning to think about a bit of supernatural um, goings on in Tweedsmuir. And the, and the burn that runs down from Weird Law down here um, is called Hallow Burn. And again, Hallow Burn would have, would have been a Halloween reference. So witches and wizards and the supernatural. So um, there are so many references to the supernatural in our area um, and, and lots of these names I think might have developed during the pre-Christian pagan traditions. So paganism was believe, believe, paganism believed that the world of the past, the present and the future all merge with each other and, and nature is sacred. So, um, you know, the, all these things are, are very um, sort of ancient um, ancient names that have just come through um, in, in, our, um, in our area. Um, and on Weird Law, you can see some here, but there's also some just off, off the site down at this end as well. So there's cremation ceremonies on Weird Law that date back to 1490 BC. Um, they've never really been investigated, but it's just you know really interesting that there were people in this area doing sort of sacred um, traditions even at that point in time. Oh, it's working again. So, Carlisle's Lynn. So, obviously, this is the photo um, of us looking underneath um, Carlisle's Bridge in Tweedsmuir. Um, the bridge was built, it's this bridge, or, or the bridge, the original bridge, this bridge was built in 1783, although it uh, um, replaced an earlier bridge that was um, built sometime between 1694 and 1741. Um, it was a really important bridge at that point in time because that was the first crossing this far up the Tweed and um, until that point the only way of accessing the kirk was by standing stones and um, down and um, just opposite the, the kirk site um, that, that we know at the minute um, and this bridge Carlisle's bridge was sea listed um, until the renovations were carried out by Scottish Borders Council in 2012. So why is it called Carlisle's Bridge? Now there's no real evidence and nobody really knows. However, um, there's strong indications that it, it was Carlisle's Brig um, and that there's been a sort of change when they've changed maps and we've, we've written it up, the, the, the spelling has changed. And Carlo is from the old Scots word Carlin, which means which, um, and the Carlisle's Carlin's lick, I'm getting all confused now. Carlos Linz is the name of the waterfall underneath the bridge. So again, we're going back to another supernatural um, reference to Tweedsmuir. So who knows? Was was that why it was named? Was it because of a witch? Don't know, but it's quite exciting. Um, so this leads on to the witch trials, um, the Peebleshire witch trials. So. 
Um, obviously, Scotland, there was there were loads of witch trials in Scotland um, through the sort of 16th and 17th century, and it, it was a it was a massive um, it was a massive um, program of of I suppose the reason why these were happening is people were terrified of the devil and they really felt that the devil was around every corner ready to to catch people unawares um, and and to cause problems this was hugely supported by um the royalty and um, so they they believed in this very strongly and so did all the ministry so there was a huge persecution done basically women were persecuted and wrongly accused of being witches and it managed to make its all its way down to Peebleshire and specifically into Tweedsmuir so um the first minister of Tweedsmuir Newkirk was Alexander Trotter who who arrived in Tweedsmuir in 1644 and Mr Trotter was a witness in the trial of Bessie Forrest for witchcraft in 1649. So Bessie Forrest lived in Skirling and her trial started on the 20th of October 1649 and it ended um, a month later. Bessie was imprisoned in Peebles and that's where her confession was heard by the presbytery. So Alex Trotter was witness to her confession um, and basically um, the way they got witches or, or ladies to confess to being witches is, was by torture. So she would have been tortured basically for a month until until she um, got to the point where she wanted to confess basically to sort of end her suffering. There were 12 men who were um, present during her trial. She was characterised as being demonic and she'd been implicated as a witch by another witch, Janet Coots. So there was a lot of this happened because witches were told um, during their, um, while they were being tortured, that if they were able to, to um, inform on other witches, that perhaps their sentence would be more lenient. Of course, that didn't happen. However, when you've been tortured and, and um, you feel you've got no way out, quite often women would start um, naming other people, hopefully, in the aim of, of reducing their torture. So um, it, it's noted in Janet's trial that she'd been told that she wouldn't be burnt if, if she told, um, if she gave evidence about other witches who, were, um, who she knew. It's not clear what happens to Bessie. Um, her record shows that there was not enough, enough information to um, convict her of being a witch. There's no information as to whether she was actually um, executed or whether she was um, released. But in the trial notes, it does note that they discovered that she had the devil's mark on her neck. Um, so the way they discovered that witches had devil's marks on them is, is they stripped them naked and they looked for any sort of um, blemish on the skin. And then they would stab these blemishes in the hope that they didn't bleed. And actually, quite often, if you think, really, so if, if you think about think about it, you know, it, it would be an incredibly difficult for women to cope, you know, in, in 1600, to cope with the fact that they'd been stripped naked in front of 12 other men and were having, so it's just a horrendous thought to think um, that this was happening to these women. Um, Bessie was also accused of charming that she was able to um, um, summon the devil and, and all sorts of things. So um, I just think it's really interesting that something like this, you know, it was we all know about it happening in North Berwick, these big witch trials, but however, it was also happening in Peeblesshire and we have a direct link to it, to it happening in Tweedsmuir. Sometimes it works as well, is it? Is it? That one. What the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to move away from a bit of um, a bit of the mystery and the um, supernatural, and look a little bit about some of the hill names. Um, one hill name that's particularly interesting me is the Crown of Scotland. So the Crown of Scotland, um, if you can see on this map, it's it's maybe there's Fruid Reservoir, the, the sort of farm end of Fruid Reservoir, um, and if you head across, um, we have Tweed Hope Foot up here on the A701 and the source of the Tweed here at Tweed Wells. Well, the Crown of Scotland 
sort of one of the hills in the middle of that um, landscape there. And it's not a very impressive hill. It's not particularly high. However, it's got a fantastic name, the Crown of Scotland. And there's some evidence, um, nobody's really been able to explain it, but there's some evidence that Robert the Bruce first met his lifelong friend, James Douglas, the Lord of Douglas, at Eric Stain, a short distance from the Crown of Scotland in 1305, 1306, which is pretty impressive if that really did happen. Um, Robert was supposedly on his way to Schoon to be crowned King of Scotland. Um, so did, did we decide to name that hill after this really important meeting? The Crown of Scotland. So this hill here um, is actually on an ancient Roman road and on, on, on a, a pilgrim's way, which runs up from Moffat. So obviously it, it, at that point of time, it was you know a, a, a route that people would be traveling. So it's quite exciting to think that Robert the Bruce might have been there and he might have met James Douglas. I think that's a great story. I'm quite happy to believe it. I don't need any more evidence, I don't think. Um, and so here's another hill that I just think is a great name. So Strawberry Hill, why on earth would we have Strawberry Hill in Tweedsmuir? There's um, Fruid Reservoir again and Strawberry Hill just sits um, at the far end of um, at Fruid Reservoir, just above the farms. Um, so, so this all links back to the Frasers. Um, the Frasers um, arrived in Scotland in the 12th century, maybe slightly earlier, but in the 12th century from Normandy in France. And the crest of the Frasers has these, um, how do you say it, these sink, sink foils, so the strawberry flowers um, on, on, their, um, on their crest. So um, it's quite likely that in France, um, Fraser had, very, had a lot of different um, spellings and possibly it was a corruption of the French phrase, meaning strawberry. So the first Frasers to arrive in Tweedsmuir um, was Oliver Fraser, the Oliford, who witnessed the documents in the reign of King Malcolm IV in 1153. So um, Oliver Fraser built both Fruid and Oliver castles um, in 1153 and 1165. Um, so I think that's a fantastic story. You sort of, you know, you don't really appreciate that Strawberry Hill has such a um, a good link to one of the, the important families that lived in Tweedsmuir. So the Fraser heritage still lives on in the Tweeddale area. The quarter dams of Peebleshire include the five five sink foils, and the ancient portion of the market cross in the high street of Peebles actually shows the engraving of strawberry plants. So a really good link still to an ancient Tweedsmuir family. So Wormhill, I was hoping to get a photo of this, but Hazel's phone apparently died today, so she couldn't get me the photo I'd asked for. So I'm going to have to just explain. Wormhill is the pointy round hill at Mosfenin. So as you come down, come down from um, Broughton, heading towards Tweedsmuir. And Wormhill, so there's been lots of ways that Wormhill's been pronounced over the years and it's spelt differently. Um, so we're not really sure where the name comes from, but Wyrm, W-Y-R-M in Old Scots, means serpent or reptilian monster, a dragon or reptile of some sort, like a snake. So, sort of one thought might be that Wormhole is so named because it represents a snake-like dragon coiled round in a circle. Now there's a lot of legends, um, there are a lot of Wormhills around the, um, around the UK, and there are legends associated with the name Wormhill. So there's a Wormhill in County Durham, and the, the legend that, that accompanies the naming of that hill is that a worm, probably a lamprey, um, was caught in the river and grew bigger and bigger until it eventually terrorises the village. The worm, or the dragon, curls itself around the hill and lives there, um, terrifying um, the local residents. So could this story have been retold by storytellers travelling up the Tweed? Um, is this the story that we then link to a, to a worm or a lamprey that was caught in the tweed? I think that's quite exciting. I'm quite happy to believe that's where that came from. So probably um, one of the better known stories of, of Tweedsmuir, I think, is Bonnie Bertha. 
And I think this is a great story. This is the, this is the one of the stories that we need to sell about trees. I mean, it's a fantastic story linking us to the monarchy um, and, and just a really lovely story. Uh, maybe not um, maybe not for King Kenneth, but it, it's a really lovely um, legend that I think we need to, to, to tell people about. So, um, so Bonnie Bertha lived at Bad Lou in a shepherd's, shepherd's house and she was known for her beauty. She was an only child and lived with her father, her mother having died during childbirth. King Kenneth the Grim of Scotland, who was Kenneth III, um, was a wise, good looking and charming man and ruled Scotland between 996 and 1004. Kenneth was a really popular king and the Grim in his name refers to his great strength. He regularly came to Palmwood Lodge to hunt within the dense forest of Caledon. Um, and he was a really keen huntsman hunting deer, wild boar and the wild cattle of Tweedsmuir. So one day while he was out in a hunt, Kenneth lost his way in a great mist and found himself at a door of a cottage in Bad Lou. The door was opened by the shepherd's beautiful daughter, Bertha. Kenneth and Bertha fell in love and Kenneth visited Bertha often. However, Kenneth was already married, although his marriage to the Queen was a loveless one. Um, and eventually, Bertha moved to Paul Mood and became the King's mistress. She gave, birth the kid, sorry, she gave birth to the King's son, and Kenneth adored Bertha and their son. Bertha and their King may have had more children. It's very difficult to make, um, to sort of work out how many children that they did have. But it is clear that Bertha brought much happiness to the King. So Kenneth was called away to war and to fight with the Danes who were invading the Scottish kingdom. The battle was won and Kenneth headed back to court where he discovered his queen had died from a madness and a fever. Kenneth was overjoyed at the thought that he could now marry Bertha, his true love. However, heartbreak was to ensue. While, Kevin, while Kenneth was at war, his jealous queen had decided to rid herself of the king's mistress and had sent her men to murder Bertha her, and her son and her father. Kenneth was heartbroken on hearing the news and traveled up to Tweedsmuir where a peasant showed him where Bertha and his son were buried. Kenneth took a spade to the grave to prove to himself that the story was true. Kenneth's heart was broken and he was a broken man. Um, so several years later, he had to lead an army against the forces of his brother Malcolm, um, where Kenneth was defeated. So this is where it becomes a little bit unclear. It's not exactly clear what happened to Kenneth. There are various versions of the story at this point. Some versions say that he was wounded in the head and his eyes were burnt out. Some say he was deserted by his army on the battlefield and taken captive and tortured. And other accounts say that he died on the battlefield. Some versions of the story even say that he returned an invalid to Bad Lou to die in the Tweedsmuir Hills. However he dies, it does seem certain that Kenneth died in physical and mental anguish. So what a fantastic story. Can you believe that happened in Tweedsmuir? I love that. I think that's great. There we go. Okay, let's move on to um, Jack the Giant Killer. Well, it may be Jack, it may not be Jack. We'll just go with Jack. Um, as one of the names that seem to, to um, occur in some of the legends. So this is a story that relates to the standing stones on the Fruid Road. Um, these stones date from about 2000 BC um, and they're often referred to as a Druid circle or the remains of a Druid temple, but they predate the Druids by quite a long time. Tweedsmuir Parish records of 1845 state that there were other stones within the circle, more than the three, but many of these stones were carted away, presumably um, to build dikes or, or as part of foundations for houses. The monument is, is now protected as a schedule monument, meaning that it's deemed to be of natural importance. The largest of the stones is named the giant stone. And there are a few myths and legends that, that give us some, um, some insight as to why they might have been called that. So in 1845, um, in the statistical account, the legend surrounding the giant stone states that 
From behind it, a person of diminutive stature, known by the name of Little John, discharges an arrow at the head of a freebooter, who's a pirate or a lawless adventurer, of formidable dimensions, who, is great, who has greatly annoyed the peaceful inhabitants and who, though on the opposite side of the tweet, was unable to elude the deadly stroke. So little John in that case managed to take the giant down. Um, another ver version written by Janet and Colin the folklorists um, changed the story slightly. So the giant stone and the two nearby mark the place where giant Jack, the giant killer, dispatched his last victim. Jack hid behind the giant stone to shoot, but unfortunately, the mortally wounded giant managed to get a punch in, and Jack, sorry, and Jack was himself killed. The stone now acts as his gravestone. So was it Jack? Was it John? Who knows? However, it does seem like somebody in Tweedsmuir was causing a lot of bother and um, somebody decided it was worth trying to um, eradicate him. So who was this giant? There's a few references to the giant as well. In 1715, Alexander Pennycook wrote, Upon the head of a burn on the south side of the Tweed stands the old house of Hawkshaw, belonging to Porteous, from a numerous race of ancestors, chiefs of that name. Over against the foot of Hawkshaw, burn in a cane beside the high road is the giant's grave. So called from a huge and mighty fellow that robbed all on the way, but was at length from a mount over the other side of the tree, surprised and shot dead as tradition goes. So that grave is, is the lump in my field which is, um, we knew when we bought the land, it's, it's marked on the OS map as the, as the giant's grave, but we didn't have any sort of story to follow it up. So, um, so it's, it's sort of interesting to think that the, the burial place of this hero of romance who was a gigantic stature and imitated, Im, in, intimidated. thank you, intimidated the, the residents of Tweedsmuir was was brought um, was shot by Jack um, to, to to save people. So that's quite a fab story, isn't it? So now we, we move on to something maybe not quite so um, not quite so great. Oh, got somebody else in there. Um, so the plague in Tweedsmuir. I mean, obviously, we all know about the plague um, in Edinburgh, which was um, sort of raging in 1645. However, it also came to Tweedsmuir. Um, and when it came to Tweedsmuir, it actually um, caused the worst outbreak in the whole of the Upper Tweed area. Um, so Marion, Marion Chisholm came from Edinburgh to Tweedsmuir carrying a bundle of clothes. And it's thought that the plague was, was within that bundle of clothes, that the infection was in, was in there. And when she arrived in Tweedsmuir, she brought it with her. She moved um, into households um, at Upper Mingan and, and she died relatively short soon after she arrived. Two weeks later her mother died um, and a few weeks after that um, three other women um, died from the plague as well, one of them who was only four or five years old. Um, the, the, um, the houses basically were, were toppled on top of the, the, the plague victims and then set on fire. So it's, it's really quite a harrowing story to think that um, you know this sort of small community of Tweedsmuir still had a, a huge, the, the plague managed to have a huge impact on them. Um, so, so another, um, you know, another interesting story. Here we go. So, um, so Jeannie of the Crook. So Jeannie of the Crook has sort of caught my attention because um, she was um, the landlady of the of the crook um, in the in the eighteen hundreds, and and she really she'd only died. Uh, sorry, she only lived until she was about thirty two, but she seems to have had a huge impact on Tweedsmuir community, and and her name is still um, sort of recognised today. And and I think even a hundred years after her death, she was still thought of really um, well within the community. So you know, why does somebody? Who's just the Crook's landlady creates such an important part of our of our local history. 
um, she was um, so Jeannie was born in the Crook. Um, her her mum and dad were were the landowners. Sorry, the landlords before before she took over. Um, she married Thomas Johnston on the thirteenth of November, eighteen thirty nine. Um, and this was only very shortly before she died. Jeannie would have been 32 and Thomas was probably 23. The family name of Johnson suggests that, that Thomas was actually her cousin. So after Jeannie died, Thomas became the innkeeper of the crook. Um, and once, so, so once, sorry, Jeannie and her mother both died. So why, why, why did sort of that, did, did, did Jeannie become such an important part? Um, and obviously it's got something to do with the fact that this poem was written by her. Um, about. Sorry, about her. So there was an article that was in the Peebleshire Advertiser on the 20th of April, 1889, which contains reminiscences of Tweedsmuir, its hills, its people, an address delivered by Dr Carruthers of Edinburgh to the members of the Edinburgh Peebleshire Union. So in his address, Dr Carruthers noticed, notes that before 1831, Mr Hutchison, who was Jeannie's father, who was the tenant at the Crook, was in the habit of buying hay and corn from several of the Tweedside farmers. On a fixed day, they were all invited to the Crook to dine and to re receive reimbursement. The Reverend Hamilton Paul from Broughton was also invited. In 1831, the Earl of Weems built the Crook in its present state, and Mrs Hutchinson had a grand house heating, dinner for her friends and neighbours to celebrate the renovations. After the dinner, at which the Reverend, Reverend Hamilton Paul of Broughton was croupier, he sang his own composition, a work never before performed dedicated to the health of Miss Jean, Jeannie Hutchison, entitled Jeannie of the Crook, which is the poem that we've got on the screen here. So, so this, this poem sort of reveals his desire for Jeannie, Jeannie to be his wife. However, it, it's, I think it's quite clear to see there's probably quite a lot of banter within this. And I think Jeannie probably, um, being, being 32 before she was married in the 1800s, Probably there was a lot of young men and, and people who'd attempted to get Jeannie's hand and she was having none of it. And it sounds like she was quite a strong lady and was quite capable of coping with all this sort of innuendo. Um, and I think it was all just a bit of tongue in cheek and a bit of fun and um, uh, 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 you know part of, part of the history of the crook. So you can see at the end of this, um, basically Jeannie tells, tells them um, the Reverend Hamilton Paul, no, you're far too old for me. I'm not going to even consider being your wife. So um, let's let's move on. Um, but what's really interesting, I think, is that this poem, which um, was sung to the tune of Jock of Hazeldean, was actually sung for a hundred years in Tweedsmuir after Jeannie's death as a very popular community song. And John Buchan, in his history of Peeblesshire, notes that you know it, it was a song that was regularly sung by the locals at any sort of Cayley or event that they held. Um, and I'd never heard it sung, so um, I sort of put a little appeal out to ask if anybody would like to have a go at, at recreating this, singing this song to Jock of Hamildean. Um, and so we've had quite a lot of volunteers who've had a go. And Andrew's going to um, when we get to Andrew's part of the of the talk, he's going to. Um, share one of these versions with you that has now been stored in our um, in our heritage database. You can see what you think. We've also been um, offered that um, um, Sarah from the village has offered to teach us all how to sing it so that when we have our next Kaylee, we can all sit down and we can all sing Genie of the Crook um, as it was sung. Well, it's not been heard really for a hundred years. I think that's great. Um, and so then just coming up, Sort of a bit up to date just to show that the heritage of Tweedsmuir is always um, changing and we're always getting new stories that have have got sort of a lot of interest to the to the community and I, I knew on since I'd sort of arrived in Tweedsmuir that, that, that a plane had crashed on Broadlaw but to be fair I hadn't known anything more about it until sort of starting to do a little bit of work for the database. 
So on the 16th of January 1953, pilot Nicholas Charles Wald Wadham was killed um, when his plane crashed on Broadlaw. So he was a trainee Royal Navy pilot, pilot stationed at Anthorm in Cumbria. Um, he was briefed to fly an aerobatics practice flight um, and a controlled descent practice. So he took off at 12.03 and made contact with the air traffic controller at Anthorn to notify him that he was airborne. After this, there was no further contact from Midshipman Wadham, despite an order requiring him to, to make contact every 20 minutes during his flight. So the aircraft was next seen at 12.40 by a shepherd as it flew over Tweedsmuir at a height estimated to be 50 to 100 feet before it turned south along one of the valleys just to the east of the village. So shortly afterwards, the, sh the shepherd heard a bang and immediately assumed that there had been a crash. Two hours later, the crash site was located by another shepherd close to the summit of Little, Little Knock, an outlier of Broadlaw. So then if we look a little bit at the accident report, it gives us a little bit more information as to why this might have happened. So the accident report concluded that the aircraft had struck while in steep climb on the opposite side of the ridge. The aircraft bounced over the summit before its port wing dug in and caused the wreck to cartwheel and come to rest inverted. Another fact that was determined was that a friend of the pilot lived in a house very close to the point where he turned south up the valley. It states, from the accounts of the eyewitnesses and examination of the wreckage, it would appear that Midshipman Wadham was beating up his friend's house against orders and that when endeavouring to climb away from the small, narrow, blind valley, the aircraft was unable to obtain sufficient height to, to um, clear the summit. So quite a sad story, to be fair. A bit of fun being had by a by a pilot, which um, didn't really end didn't really end well. But still, a really important part of the stories of Tweedsmuir. Oh, and that's me. Right. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the database we've been putting together. So as Les Leslie's, you know, quite um, well. Um, demonstrated there's a lot of stories uh, uh, related to Tweedsmuir and we've only just scratched the surface there's, there's pl plenty more uh, um, available um, and as Leslie also said there is a kind of feeling that uh, these stories are starting to be lost to the community and um, it's important that we we retain them there's an awful lot of um, information about the air area stored in dusty old books and and you know how long will we uh, will have access to these things? You know, so it occurred to me that it might be a good idea for us to start gathering all this together. And and because my background is working with computers, I thought perhaps what we should do is create some kind of database, some kind of digital um, storage system to allow us to save this for um, for uh, our, for our um, enjoyment and also the enjoyment of people in the future. So. That was, you know, we've got this great heritage that we want to save. But another important thing is that um, we are creating the heritage right now, which is um, uh, going to be interesting for people in the future. Well, one thing which kind of inspired me was that back in the 1980s, there was um, a project done by, uh, the, I think it was the BBC were involved in it, where they record, they were doing a, a digital doomsday book and they, they went all around the country and recorded just um, a little bit of information about, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they interviewed school children, they interviewed, you know, it, you know, loads and loads of people around the country and stored it on an on a amazing technology for then a, a laser disc. And um, I'd forgotten all about this, but I can remember in the 80s, you know, it was a big thing. Some, some of the people in my school were asked to um, talk, to, to contribute to it. And um, I'd forgotten about uh, about it for years, but you know, a little while ago, I remembered, and I, I I searched for it online, and it'd been transferred to to a website, and there was when I searched for it, I, I found a story written by my my younger brother talking about 
our our life on our little um, sm small holding and talking about how we used to have a um, a, a Honda 70 cc tri uh, trike and drove around it. And I thought, you know, at the time that seemed a, you know unimportant trivia, but now for me it was it was a great way of inspiring a memory and it really summed up what was happening in that area at the time so i thought maybe we need a way of storing this kind of information um, for our community so that's an, another aspect to the uh to the to the database that i don't want it just to be used for storing all this historic information i want it to be stored used for storing what's happening now so um the idea is that it will be publicly available and you will be able to submit just interesting things or things even day-to-day -day things which are happening in your lives in the community say it there could be um something going on at the hall you might have a few photos of people singing a song or, or having a party it may be um it may be a recording of someone uh, doing something and you'll be able to submit this to the database and store that for posterity so Yes, at the moment it's you know it doesn't seem very exciting seeing a few photos of the kids running around at a Christmas party, but in 50 years it will be interesting, and it's it's worth retaining this and remember remembering that the stuff that we think is just uh, you know day to day in a in a in a, a certain amount of time will be an interesting record of what what's happening in Tweedsmere. And I think Tweedsmere is a very special community. It's very different to pretty much anywhere else it's nothing like living in a in a town it's nothing like living you know in most of the country so i think it's really important that we record what goes on in this community and show the strength of community spirit and, and what go what goes on so that was the kind of the logic behind creating this database um, as i say it will be publicly available for you to submit your own um, contributions whether whether it is um, um, something historic you may have you know historic records of the deeds of your house or or you may you know you may have in the loft you know you know pictures from 100 years ago that's fantastic if you could if you want to um, submit those to the database that, that that's that's brilliant we would love that but we'd also love you to submit you know as i said the the photos of the christmas party or the fo photos of you working in your garden you know, any, anything which you think might at one day someone might just be interested in. So, so that's going to be available very soon. A link to the, the website which is um, being created, um, which is going to um, show, you know, show a lot of aspects about uh, tweets. You know, there'll be a, um, a link to the, to the database system which will allow you to put your information in. Uh, we have been, uh, um, up to now, we have been um, adding a lot of the historic data uh, information into the database and I'm going to just show you a quick snapshot of what of what we've got so I'm going to just share uh, the screen again so just bear with me now I think that should be you should be seeing here now this i have can to you see the one that says tweet your heritage repository is that what's on yeah, your good screen? okay yeah, that's great. good this looks very unexciting i have to say i have my in my defense this is the the side of the data system which is for the people or the administrators of the system okay they we're going to have to have a couple of people in the community who keep track of the information that goes in and uh, ensures it's it's uh, documented correctly and it, all, all the kind of background work it's not not an onerous task but it's just a matter of curating the information so if someone submits submit someone through the public website they'll they'll go and check we've got all the information we need who owns it and all that kind of stuff so this is the system that allows people to uh, the administrators to manage the system the system so it doesn't look awfully exciting at this point but it, it does a lot of things. So what you're seeing here is a whole load of the records that we've got in the system. And, and down the bottom, this is showing what, um, records one to 10 of 160 entries. So we've had some willing volunteers. Well, I say willing, we had to pay my kids to do this, but um, um, they've been typing in 
the uh, information that uh, we've uh, been gathering over the last year, year or so. So all the stuff Hazel's, uh, all the stuff, <laughs> all the stuff <laughs> it has been Hazel, hasn't yeah, it? <laughs> all the stuff Leslie's been talking about about tonight, um, and lots, lots more. We've got lots of historical photographs. Um, we've got photographs of things which are uh, interesting. For example, if I have a look at um, just picking one at random, what would be a, a crook in postcard? I'll click on that one. And you can see, oh, I'll have to log in again. Hold on. You can see it's very secure. Don't want anyone getting in here without that um, permission. So if I click on the file, you can see someone has um, scanned that old postcard, postcard which was sent to the crook in and copied it into, into the system. So that, although the, we don't have access to the postcard itself, we have a record of it. So this if so yeah, yeah and, and you can and you can read you can read it and can read it? well i can't i can't we had it. a wonderful we had a wonderful meal maybe at up here in the joyous weather had lunch on sharp and tea on the top of a hill so <laughs> this is a marvelous hotel i wish you could see the Tweet, and Heather, and Heather, yeah. So, but it just it just shows you this is the kind of thing we're looking looking for, and um, you know we might not have this postcard, but we've now got a, a a copy a copy of it, which is now stored for the community, and you know we're we're adding um, stuff like this to the database all the time, and you'll be able to go in and search for something. So you may want to um, you may you may want to go and um, uh, do a little bit of research on a particular area or a particular um, topic and the system will allow you to um, search in many different ways. For example, um, it allows you to specify a, a where the th when we add these things to the database, we specify where they're actually linked to. So this is linked to the crook. You can see the little um, red, red marker there. So for example, if you're at the crook and you thought, oh, I wonder what interesting things have uh, uh, are relevant to my look at my current location. Um, you could search the database and it would pull back all the things linked to your per, your current location. So perhaps uh, you live in the village, you might think, I wonder what, what's relevant to you know the area within a um, 100 yards of my house. You could put that into the system and it will pull back all the records which are linked to your to the area where you are. You could be at the top of a hill with your mobile phone and you could put in and say, well, tell me what interesting things are happening have happened at the top of this hill and it'll pull back anything which is relevant relevant to you so it's going to allow you to search the search through the information in many different ways and it's going to allow um, you to ensure that not, none of this information is, is lost but we're going to make a, a, a concerted effort to ensure this is kept for um, kept secure for a very very long time um, we're almost at the at the phase now where you as as a public will be able to go and add things to it and search things through it that should be available within the, hopefully within the next month or two um, but what we're kind of putting hoping is that we might get some interest from people to um, put information into the system we could add you as an administrator and you could you could go through um, the records we've already collected so if you've got an interest in in um, helping with that aspect of it, then um, Leslie would be delighted to hear from you and you'll be given a, a set of records to go and, go and um, copy in and, and, um, and, and add to the system. We're also hoping that it will inspire people and tell people, you please tell people about this, um, to, you know, go and look through your loft and have a look. Have you got some black and white photos which are relevant to the area? Have you got something which you think, well, actually, that would be worth keeping rather than, you know, who knows what might happen to these, these things if they're not kept, um, stored now. So if you've got something you think is even slightly um, uh, in interesting and related to Tweedsmuir, then this is the, this is the time to hand it over 
and uh, get, we can scan it and we can put it into the system. So just just think what you can what you you might have somewhere, which even like the deeds to your house, all all kinds of things. <coughs> um, the other task we will need. Oh, I need you to you need a crook. Oh yes, okay. So you need to go back and search. Yes, that. well, I'll I'll go and look for G G need a crook because it's not just photos; it's also store it stories. If I go back to the rec record list. Um, it's not just just photos. You, can, you um, we can if you if you know a story, you can you can put put in um uh you can put in a uh, write up the story in a in a uh, in, as text. And you can put put that in. Um, for example, um, a little lady of old years. If I if I show you this, this has been added as as a story to it. So, you know, anything that's relevant to Tweedsmuir can be added to it. If we go and find Genie of the Crook, if I put in. Genie, there we go, Genie of the Crook. Which one was that, Scott Murray, that one? Yeah. Okay, so you can also add video to it. You can add audio to it. So this is um, the audio version of, of G Genie of the Crook. This was, right. so this, was, um, this was recorded by Scott Murray, who doesn't live in Tweedsmuir, but he's um, he's really taken Genie of the Crook since we, since I've, well, it's actually Sarah Northcott spoke to him and he's, He's he's taken it on board and actually looked at even some of the lyrics and thinks that there might have been a mis misprint um, over time. Perhaps you know something has the original lyrics just by the way he looked at them. He felt that there had been a misprint and he sort of re re um, configured them in this this version. And I think he's right, having sort of looked at what he thought was the what was it. And then you can imagine you know something that was written on a scrap of paper and in, in strange writing, and then someone else wrote it down and it was printed and. 100 years later it was changed a bit further so see what you think i quite like this version right so i'll play it right so i'm going to play it but if you can't hear it let me know because the sharing might not share that the audio so i'll, I'll play it and we'll, we'll see if it's not if you can't hear it then let me know and we'll figure out a way of doing it how are the banks of tweed charming when smiles the blooming year, how sweet to tread the flowery mead when summer days are near. To visit Tala's waterfall or roam along the brook, and then to spend an hour or two with Jeannie o' the crook. How happy be the favoured youth when roaming on Tweed's side, shall hear frae lovely Jeannie's mouth. Oh, I will be your bride, and I as money a bow advance and catch a wistful look, in hopes to catch a kindly glance frae Jeannie o oh, the crook. Could I licht on some sheltered spot? Among the hills say green, or a rear a rural cot, to harbour me and Jean. Or could I in yon bonny glen find out some cosy nook, or I enjoy my life might spend with Jeannie o the crook. But ways my hair. The days are gain, the days that I hae seen. I ain't had hope, no I hae nain. For hark the words, O Jean. If ye be wise, take my advice, gang hame and mind your book. For, O oh, dear Paul, your far are all. For Jeannie, oh, the crook, for, oh, dear Paul, your far our old. For Jeannie, oh, the crook. So they, there you go. That's, um, that's probably not been heard around Tweedsmuir for a hundred years, but because of what we're, pl what we're doing, it's come to life again and it's it's hopefully going to become part of our community again um and the, 
the database. Did people hear it? Can you, did, did you hear that okay? Francis heard it. Yeah, everyone yeah. heard it except for you, Christine. Yeah, I'll have you. to play it to you on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't hear it, Fergus. Okay, well, we'll have to have to organise a community event once COVID's finished, where we can play it, play it to everyone. So, um, yeah, okay. So the database can store all kinds of things: video, photos, text, whatever. So, start thinking of things you could add to it and try to get involved if if you can. But um, that's really the, that's really the the message. Um, I think Leslie's just saying: Is there any questions? So sorry you couldn't hear Jeannie of the group, but I'll I'll definitely make sure that we can you can once we share the, the database you can go in and see it all by yourself. What? Dad sort of talking, you can hear it. Oh you oh. can hear Dad, but you can hear Jeannie. All right. So, so we can hear us all again. Thanks, Fergus. All right, just going for that, I would like to say thank you very much to both of you. I think these talks have been great right out through. Um and anybody who's still watching rugby, they've just missed a, a very good night. <laughs> so that's their fault. It's really great, I think, what you're doing. And I hope it does encourage people to put update stuff onto the website. And it, and it really generates quite a lot. I think it's a, a great idea and a, a fantastic thing. And very interesting to find out all these old stories. It's been a tremendous night. So thank you very much. And Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. I did hear the singing. Oh, good. Thank you so much, Leslie and Andrew. That was brilliant. And I, I really don't mind if people now go, I just want to go and watch the rugby. <laughs> you can really just do that. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I just say we need to send all the songs up through. I mean, that's what I was brought up on. Yeah. We'll see what the score is. <laughs> Just tell us what the score is, James. <laughs> no, don't tell us. <laughs> oh, no, don't tell us. <laughs> that was excellent. Oops. Oh, it's now Thank six. You, Thank six. you. Yeah. Leslie. Yes. Could could I ask a bit? I was thinking a bit about people who've been characters around Tootsmuir in sort of living memory. Um. Not that I've known many, but I remember Willie and Nettie, you know, that had the garage and yeah, oh yeah, you know, they were just amazing people. Yeah. And uh, Andrew Lorimer is the other one, most Fennan, and you know his book, and which I have somewhere. I haven't read it for years, but there's, uh, uh, I don't know, they were that same generation, I suppose. Whether would that work? I don't know. I think I think that's the thing that I think you find out about Tweedsmuir is everybody in Tweedsmuir is a wee bit strange, you know. You don't <laughs> you don't live in Tweedsmuir unless you've got something a bit different about you. And I think there's been all through history. I mean, if you think about the Covenanters, I mean, they are incredibly strong people, um, and they they and and you know had, had such an important part to play in Tweedsmuir and I think that runs all the way through. The people of Tweedsmuir are a bit different from other people and I think that's a really important thing to try and, you know, exactly like you say, let's let's get some stories about these people that you remember um, before you know, before nobody remembers these people. Um, so, so it is important if you, even if you think you know, oh I'm sure everybody knows about this, put these things down, you can record it you know, um, or, or through audio, you could you could you could speak you, you could just speak it, or you could uh, write it down, but in some way record it, and then we can put it in the system, so it's definitely kept for posterity. We 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 need to keep these things. I, I was thinking also. I'm sure you've got this, but uh, I read Witchwood recently. You know, Buckins Witchwood, and that's an incredible description of. Uh, um, well, witches and uh, devil craft and uh, the plague and the effect on the whole countryside. But, you know, it's set in Broughton, of course, or thereabouts. And I don't know whether that's beyond where you're thinking about. And of course, you know, it, it's a it's a novel. But that whole 1650, it's all, in that, it's all at that time, as you know. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, even, even if it's... Um, 
obviously put my whole novel in is probably probably uh, uh, a, a bit much, but having someone um, write something about the relevance to tweet or relevance to to broaden and having that kind of information is is valuable as well. So you know that there's there's all way, all kinds of ways you can you could contribute to it. Yeah, I mean, I think we were looking at some a lot of Buchan's novels have been reviewed in the community news. So we were thinking of perhaps including the reviews that have been done over the last period of time so that that would be something that would then, you know, record it and then people could think, right, well, I'd actually like to go and read the whole novel because obviously we can't cut and paste the whole thing and drop it in. But I mm -hmm. think I think there's, you know, we to try and include all. I mean, there's so much stuff. It just it, I mean, it's almost impossible to understand how much big history there is around Tweetsmere. You, it's just such a small place. But we've been sort of involved in a lot of big. Um, I think uh, you've just done it. Sorry. Yes, there's a lot of literature around with John Buchan, good stories, um, and I think we should include the literature um, uh, from, from John Buchan and and others in, in the story. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's there's no real r r rules here. If you think it's important and you want to save it and it's related to the area, then put it in the put it in the system. And um, if you find it interesting, someone else is bound to at some point. So you know, go go ahead. We're not short of space. There's plenty of space there. So just just if any anything you think is interesting, just let, we'll get in. It should you should be able to start doing this very shortly. And I think there's a lot of stuff about families as well. I mean, having spoken to different people about sort of a bit of their own family history, it's really interesting. I find it fascinating about how some of the really key people um, sort of in, in a, um, current affairs over the last two or 300 years have been based in Tweetsphere. Like they're really important people and they're linked to various families that are still here now. So it's, it's great to have those sorts of stories um, recorded and, and, and um, accessible to other people. We, we sure also, Anne, Anne, Duncan, you've got lots of work to do there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have um, people so sort of passing by from time to time from the, the States or Australia because there are family links with Tweedsmuir. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. these people might be interested in the Tweedsmuir stories. I'm sure they would. Mm -hmm. We've got a lovely sketch book from um, Aunt Molly in the 20s of all sorts of places round about. And she was a trained artist, you know, so lovely stuff. Well, I've got to say, by the time we get to the stage where it's accessible to everybody, currently it's incredibly easy to put things in because I'm doing it as an administrator and it's really easy. Andrew assures me it's going to be 200 times easier once, <laughs> once it's made um, sort of accessible to the public. So it's so simple. It will be so simple to use. It'll get to the point where you just think, right, that was a great photo I took today um, showing X, Y, or Z. I'm just going to drop that in as well because then it's there. And it's, it, I hope that's how it will be used, that people will just keep it as a, as a obviously a historical record, but also a, 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 history, a, a record of things going forward. So, it, so it's always being added to. You're going to need a big database to put it all on. Oh, it's big. Andrew assures me we can't fill it. Let's let's try. <laughs> you wait until I get inside the system. And it'll go. Great. That's a promise. <laughs> and, and I think the thing is, Andrew's set it up in such a way that he doesn't think it will become obsolete. So so you know, in 50 years' time when uh, we don't use Word documents anymore or whatever we don't use, but the systems he's set up in a database should still be accessible. So so it's saved forever. It's not going to become um, outdated or, or time limited, hopefully. Yes, well, <laughs> let's hope so. Well, 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 we'll not be here. So we'll, we'll be, we'll be okay. You can't, not be our problem. you can't come back and complain to us. Right. Looks like an English try coming. Oh, the English one. It's Scotland versus France. I'm, I mean, a, I mean, a French one is what I meant because they're, they're, they're playing. Okay, okay, okay. Don't tell us the score. We're going to do it on catch up. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but you're doing it on catch work. I mean, there you go. Look, Fergus is already looking anxious that we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you all very much for um, for joining well, us thank tonight. You so thank, thank you very much. much. Very, very good, good. good program. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.